it's a very warm welcome to the Global Sports Channel today to my amazing guest, Bonnie Hancock. Bonnie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to it. You're welcome. It's always good to talk to another athlete. And um, I feel a little bit humbled, actually, because you have done already some amazing things and you're going to head off and do something that just blows my mind. I've got to tell you about that. And I'm sure everybody else is going to be amazed, too. But um, let's go back to the beginning. When did Bonnie, first of all, start to get into sport and what was her chosen sport? Where did you start off with it all, Bonnie? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in uh, Sortel, which is a tiny little town of population of about 2,000 people in Coffs Harbour um, on the beautiful north coast of New South Wales. So about uh, three hours south from the Gold Coast where I am now. So I uh, grew up right near the beach and uh, mum and dad wanted us to be safe. Um, I have three sisters. So uh, we all were basically put into surf life saving and we just happened to absolutely love it. So um, I was about five years of age when I first got on a little nipper board and was just trying to keep up with my two older sisters. And uh, we spent every afternoon in the surf. We did swimming in the pool, but we, we did a bunch of different sports. So we didn't specialize too early by any means. I mean, when you're, you're growing up, you, you want to do as many as possible. So we did basketball and athletics and touch football and cross country. And um, we're just a super, super active family. So um, I feel very lucky for that upbringing and, um, you know, for, for being provided with those wonderful opportunities, um, which led um, myself and my older sister, Courtney, to uh, move to the Gold Coast. I was 17 and, and Courtney was 18. We wanted to try and pursue an Ironwoman career. So uh, we had some success on a national and state level and age group, but mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we wanted to try and give that Nutrigrain Ironwoman series a crack. And, and moved up to the Gold Coast to, to try and do that. And we're fortunate enough to, to make that um, at those ages, 17 and 18. Wow. Now, we're going to about 103 countries around the world today, and there might be a lot of people watching and listening to you who don't know what Iron Woman series is. So can you just briefly explain that for us? Absolutely. So the uh, professional Nutrigrain Iron Woman and Iron Man series takes the different disciplines within surf life saving. So you have your board paddling, swimming, uh, running on the sand and your ski paddling. Uh, the ski paddling isn't picked up by kids until they're around, you know, 15, 16 years old. So, um, you know, for that iron woman sort of event where there's four different disciplines, it's not normally undertaken until kids are around that 15, 16, because the ski leg is within the open age group. Mm -hmm. So I only started on a ski, which is, I guess, similar to, to kayaking, but out in the surf, um, often in big ways. I only started when I was actually 17. So um, from the time I first got on a ski to actually racing, um, within the trial so you have to do a trial format before making that professional series to which they take about 20 through mm -hmm. um you know it, it was six months i had six months on that ski to basically get ready so i did a really big crash course um but within your iron woman series so an iron woman race is typically about 15 minutes long and you're doing a swim leg a board leg and a ski leg out in the surf with a run on the sand in between yeah fantastic now, there might be a lot of people watching today that are familiar with the household names in Australia anyway, like Trevor Hendy and Guy Leach and, and these people. But on the woman's side, I was always impressed, uh, Bonnie, right back in the beginning of the whole Iron Man and Women series that how women played a huge part in, in that whole series development, didn't they? You know, people like Carla Gilbert and all the others and, and yourself and your sister and it was, it was really a sport in Australia that came male, female together, didn't it? And grow together. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really interesting. I um, went to a breakfast uh, the other day as a fundraiser for my paddle, which we'll get to, but I uh, was uh, sitting with Carla Gilbert and she was saying, um, you know, the Iron Woman series only started around those late 80s, early mm -hmm. 90s, but from then it absolutely took off. So, so the Iron Men was sort of up and running a few decades prior, but the 90s were really that golden era. So, you know, um, there was the Uncle Toby series as well as the Kellogg series for the women. There was the Meadow Lee series. And these girls and guys were household names. So Carla 
absolutely dominated along with Reen Corbett. What's yeah. really interesting mm -hmm. is for the women back then, they didn't have the ski leg within the Iron Woman. Mm -hmm. So it was actually swim, board and run. Mm -hmm. um, so that developed in the early 2000s. And Carla was saying, um, you know, they used to paddle a shorter ski, which was 16 foot as opposed to 18 foot for more stability. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, herself and, and, and Reen Corbett definitely um, paved the way for us females now. And I mean, how brave they were to get on those skis and go out in the big surf when women hadn't really done that. Um, as well as the men, like you're saying, so Trevor, Guy Leach, Guy Andrews, you know, uh, my sister Courtney and I grew up absolutely idolizing these people and, <laughs> and they really inspired us to, um, to get out there. And I think we used to go out on our little nipper boards and sort of pretend we were Carla. Um, yeah. So to sort of chat with her now is a bit surreal. Yeah, it is, isn't it? When you, when that sort of thing happens. Now you talk about the, the skis and the pedals and everything else. Has there been a lot of innovation in the sport when it comes to equipment over the years? Absolutely. Huge um, steps forward in terms of the equipment. So um, back when they started, the skis were very stable. They had quite a wide seat, you know, they weren't to aerodynamic. Um, skis have always had to be um, that 18 kilos because you don't want them light, less than 10 kilos like a kayak or they'll, when you hit a wave, they'll, you'll just lose it basically, they're too light. Mm -hmm. So a surf life ski, surf life saving ski is 18 kilos. It does provide a bit of a challenge for the, the younger um, girls and guys starting off because they are quite heavy to carry. Yeah. So it's a big step and you know, it's around that age you want to sort of get your strength training up to be able to paddle the ski, but also carry it. Um, also in the development of paddles. So uh, Bennett Surfcraft lead the way in terms of the paddles. They're, they're excellent. They're carbon fiber. They're super light, but very strong. Mm -hmm. um, so they've done a good job there, but um, yeah, to where they are now, uh, for where they are now, we've come a long way. And I was lucky enough to be involved just recently in the development of the first um, female surf ski, female developed, so a low volume ski, mm -hmm. um, which is through DD3. So big steps moving forward in that space, which is really cool. Is that why we used to see um, a lot of people carrying their ski and the, the butt of the ski is dragging on the sand uh, along the way? Is that, is that because it's just so heavy? Absolutely. It's, it's quite funny, you know, um, yet your big, tough eye women and eye men, as soon as a bit of wind gets up, everyone sort of struggles with the ski. You've got your paddle and then you've got to somehow figure out how to get a board down to the beach as well. So often we have a handler or, you know, a partner or a, a parent not far behind, but when you're on your own, it can uh, definitely be a bit of a struggle and sort of brings everyone back down to earth pretty quick, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Now you're telling us about your journey getting into that series and you did start when you were very young. We have a lot of young aspiring people watching our show. So what advice would you pass on to them now looking back at the start of your career? What are some of the things that you may have changed if you started off again now? Absolutely. I, I think a big one, and I found this was growing up on in, in Coffs Harbour. I mean, I thought that I was training hard and I thought that I was doing the right thing with training, but you want to learn from the experts. So as soon as I moved to the Gold Coast, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by very experienced iron women and have an excellent coach. And by all means, they've come a long way in terms of sports science and, and nutrition and recovery. So I think it's seeking out people who have done it before you or who have done things really well. So, so that sort of, you know, looking around, finding which coach is going to, to be knowledgeable and be able to guide you and finding a squad, which is, you know, has, has a very positive environment and you're able to learn and, and even reaching out to, you know, some of these um, girls and guys you might aspire to as well. You'd be really surprised at how some of them are, um, you know, keen to share their knowledge. So I think definitely learning from those who have done it prior and also studying, you know, whether it's their videos and interviews and that kind of thing um, and being open open to adapt so so yeah you can think that things are you're doing everything right and working but there's always always something to learn and it's definitely very humbling as well when you're um in the surf and and things don't always go your way so there's also there's that resilient side as well and i think that we can learn from others so not being afraid to ask questions and learning from others i think yeah, really good pieces of advice. Now, you moved away from home when you were young with your sister. You went to the Gold Coast, as you said. So for anybody 
also watching moving away from family can be a big, big ordeal for a lot of people, right? And, and losing that support network. How did that work out for you? And was it good having your sister there giving you a pat on the back all the time? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think that's my other bit of advice for young kids. It, it will be hard when you start and you might feel like you're sort of pushing uphill and, you know, some things aren't going right. And I remember starting off, I, I had like, a couple of thousand dollars in my bank account. I didn't have a car moving up here. I didn't know how to cook or clean. And it was just a really big learning curve for me. I mean, having Courtney there was so helpful to me. I mean, not just in, in racing and getting tips from her, but I guess also in every day and having that support and that friendship as well. Um, you know, keeping your friends and family close to you. I think they're always going to be there for you and sport can be quite brutal and, I really figured that out in those early days as well. There's, there's no love lost as soon as you step on the line. So if you do have a race that doesn't go your way, it's about surrounding yourself with good people who will always be there for you and, and not let you get too far ahead of yourself as well if you have a good race. So um, I think when you're starting off, things can seem very overwhelming and very mm. hard. Mm. But if you absolutely want to achieve something and you're willing to do what it takes, I think that's, you know, the saying that you can do whatever you want, you can, but willing to do the hard work to get there. Absolutely. There should be nothing stopping you. Yeah. Really, really good piece of advice. And I like the bit too about keeping your feet on the ground, always remain humble with the mm. process as well. Right. Cause there'll be just yeah. as many bad days, if not more than there will be, uh, be happy days. Right. Let's get on to, uh, you know, current day life. And the first thing I want to ask you is for an athlete like yourself, how's the last, 12 or 18 months in this crazy world being for you how have you dealt with you know all the things that are going on and keeping your motivation levels up etc cetera, etc cetera? yeah what a wild ride it's been the last 18 months I mean I had uh 2018 and 2019 was when I first stepped into ocean ski paddling so it's I guess a almost an offshoot of surf life saving where we paddle a, a nine kilo ski instead it's about downwind racing and 20 kilometer racing um, but anyway, I was able to travel the world with that. So I went to Hawaii, Portugal, Mauritius, you know, um, right around Australia with this sport. And I thought, how good. I found something I love. I can travel the world with it. This is a great lifestyle. Um, and then come 2020, everything just stopped. So I had all of these global trips planned. I knew I had a direction in where I was going. I knew exactly what my next 12 months looked like. Mm -hmm. And as you know, for so many people that was just thrown out the window. We had to cancel all of those plans. And, and even I think as an athlete, you know, with training every day, you've got goals to accomplish. They're very tangible. You've got direction. So I think like a lot of athletes, you, you feel a bit lost to be uh -huh. honest. And, uh -huh. you know, there's virtual events and you're sort of looking for that. I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm a dietitian. So I work in, in medical clinics, helping people with different chronic conditions and what they're eating. So the one stable part for me was, was that I still had a job to go to every day, even when um, there were lockdowns because I work within health, it's considered essential in allied mm -hmm. health. So mm -hmm. I was still able to, I guess, feel like I had goals each day and feel like I, uh, you know, had challenges um, and, and, you know, things I was accomplishing each day. So I think that was an awesome part for me was, was that bit of focus on my career more so, whereas I'm, trying to juggle everything all the time yeah. so yeah the the training and the racing part like so many people you just feel lost and it's not motivating as motivating I think to get outside and and train but I soon learned that movement is just as important so I think we all had a couple of weeks off and not knowing what to do but I took up ocean swimming you know and I took up cycling and um, just a couple of fun things that I, I don't think I ever would have started if COVID wouldn't have hit. And I still integrate those things into my training program now just because I love doing them. So like a lot of people have experienced during this time, um, you know, we see positives come out of it as well. You, you've got some new cross training activities that you've taken up. Has there been anything throughout the last 18 months that you've learned about yourself specifically that you weren't maybe conscious of before? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, over the last 18 months, I've really tried to be there for others. So, um, you know, part of the 
paddle and we'll get to that that I'm doing. Um, I'm actually fundraising for Gotcha for Life, which is a mental health charity. And it's seeing um, what, you know, this virus and the effects that this virus has done to people's mental health. So I think um, I've tried to be understanding and, and be the ear, I guess, for people who have need that uh, needed that around me. And I've kind of, whether I was ready for that five years ago, um, you know, as an athlete, you can be quite self-absorbed, but I've learned now that, um, yeah, to be open and be understanding and to reach out to people if you feel they might be struggling a little bit as well. So, so that's become a passion of mine. And yeah, I just think, you know, if you have a passion and you want to help in that area, go for it. And, and I've had such a positive response with, um, you know, mentioning to people that I am fundraising for this mental health charity and they, a lot of them, you know, I've had countless people mention um, very unfortunate situations with losing, you know, loved ones to mental health. So I've sort of realised that anyone can be a bit of an ambassador, ambassador for that. And we all should be ambassadors for mental health, I think. Yeah, really well spoken. Um, let's move on now to the, the big adventure. And you've given us a really nice build up and a segue into this actual chapter of the conversation today. Australia is a pretty big island, right? And um, you've come up with a fairly crazy idea. Tell us all about it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a bit of a combination of my competitive nature, curiosity, and then the stubborn part of me as well. So three years ago, um, I picked up a book called Fearless. It's by Jo Glickman, and it was on the Freya Hofmeister story. So she's a German woman who paddled around Australia um, 16,000 kilometres around the coastline of Australia, solo, unsupported, um, on, a, on a sea kayak. So they're 100 kilos fully loaded. They're 30 kilos on their own, so they're very heavy. Uh, she did that in 10 and a half months. And I read the book and I was just so inspired. I, I read Jess Watson's book a week later too. So I always say <laughs> right. I sort of blame Jess as well because I was extremely <laughs> inspired by these women. And I just couldn't get Freya's story out of my head. And I sort of mentioned something to my husband and he sort of laughed and I didn't mention anything further. I think he thought I was going to forget about it. Yeah. But um, I started to think and the cogs were ticking. I thought, could I do this on my nine kilo ski? do it supported, you know, so it's, I mean, it's going to be absolutely dangerous in certain parts, but do it supported on a nine kilo ski. Could I do it a bit quicker? And what would that look like? And I started looking into options and again, it just built and built and built. And I started then mentioning it to a few people and uh, Shoreham Partners um, Financial Services, they're based in Sydney. They came on board as a title sponsor. So once they did that, this, this goal actually turned into reality because it's going to be an expensive trip having to um, hire a skipper and catamaran and a crew for the whole time. But initially um, I genuinely pictured just my husband following me around a little tinny. Right. And then you start to actually look at the coastline of Australia and there are sections of like a couple of hundred kilometers of limestone cliffs and yeah, you yeah. cannot come to shore in certain parts. So yeah, yeah. I quickly realized this project was going to be a lot bigger scale than what I'd imagined initially. So kayaking alone around the entire continent of Australia, which way are you going to go? Yeah, that's a really good question. And one that we've had to sort of toss up and, you know, diff different times of the year. Um, after speaking to marine biologists, um, super yacht captains, um, meteorologists, uh, we are going uh, clockwise around. So I'll be starting on the Gold Coast. I'll be heading south towards Sydney. Um, and making our way so that way we miss the wet season up the top so you don't want to head up the top anywhere near summer with cyclone season um, you know extra risk of crocodiles etc down the bottom you want to avoid the cold so mm -hmm. essentially if we head off in December and head down underneath we're getting the most favorable conditions um, it's always going to be against me at some stage and most likely that's coming back down the east coast at the end um that time of year we're most likely to have currents against us but it should be fairly favorable down the bottom east to west and then up the west coast i spoke to a few friends of mine over the last few days and told them i was going to have a chat to you today and i said give me a few questions that i can ask bonnie about you know how you think about this whole thing so 
if I can, I'll ask you a few of those questions Absolutely. now and, uh, and see how you go. So, so one of them was from a lady and she asked me, she said, is she scared about taking this challenge on? Like, are you actually generally nervous about it? Yeah, it, it's a bit of a mix of emotions. So, and I sort of, there's been so much planning involved that I haven't even really been able to get too excited, to be honest. So probably more scared than excited now, but I feel I will be excited. There's certain parts of the trip that do, yeah, I'll be honest, that do scare me. And I think that, you know, studying the coastline and the marine life, it's it's up north with the crocodiles, you know. Um, sharks, obviously, um, you know, and in recent times, they've been a little bit of a, a problem in terms of attacks. But having the boat next to me, I feel, whether it's a false sense of security, but um, at least you have support just nearby. Um, and, you know, there's certain areas perhaps where we'll be staying a bit closer to the coastline, you know, um, up north with the crocodiles. I mean, it's the opposite. So we will be going way off the coast mm -hmm. to avoid the riverbeds and the estuaries because that's where the crops go. Mm -hmm. So I keep having this image of me being in the middle of the ocean and not seeing land. And I'm trying to get used to that concept because off the Gold Coast, we paddle about six kilometers offshore often. Mm -hmm. So I almost feel all of my life's kind of been preparing me for this. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say scared, but I'm very aware of the challenges and I'm trying to visualize them as much as I can for anything that might happen, be it big surf, not being able to see land, crocodiles, sharks, stingers, hot water, cold water, that kind of thing. I was, I was going to say, you know, of all countries to choose to do this, and you've chosen one that has just about every man-eating, death-defying animal that there is in the planet. Yeah? Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I, I saw something the other day, and it was about hippos, hippopotamuses, and it says that they eat alligators. And I thought, at least I don't have hippos, but that's probably <laughs> the only one. So everything else. That could actually yeah. help you out if they took the uh, took yeah. the crocs away. Yeah, possibly. I might have to get a pet one. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone out there got a, a pet hippo? Let us know. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So another friend asked me, um, "How do you train for something like this? Does it is it different than your normal training process? Do you go beyond uh, obviously longer distances and stuff? What's involved there?" Yeah, absolutely, and it's a great question and one that does pop up a lot. The best answer to that is you can't really train exactly for it in terms of you can't go out and do 100 kilometer paddles every day which is about the distance I'm going to try to do upwards of 50 to 100k a day so I've done a couple of paddles I did 35k paddle I did 25k paddle I'm going to work up towards 50 over the next couple of months but you don't want to be busting out 100k paddles too much leading in because I don't want to go in with you know, an inflamed shoulder or different injuries. So I'm aware of that also. So what I've been trying to do is get in the gym and get strong and work on a bit of prehab stuff. So um, make sure I go in strong, do a cross of ocean swimming, paddling, running and gym. So it's not just all paddling and using those certain muscles leading in. So definitely um, some big paddles coming up over the next couple of months, but the gym component is really, really important. And um, having spoken to different people, um, one of the guys who, who's paddled halfway around Australia, he went up to the top. He said the first couple of weeks will be the hardest until your body adjusts to about that 10 hours of paddling a day. So that's going to be just hanging in there at the start and knowing that your energy systems and your muscular endurance, I guess, will, will come. I was going to say that because like most things in life that you do in a repetitive nature, it becomes habitual and you get into a rhythm. So even though this is going to be to the extreme, you will get into some kind of uh, rhythm with the process every day, won't you? Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I think you, you have to try to, you know, stick to the plan. So even there's some days where I might not feel like paddling the full hundred kilometers, it might be a really favorable day wind wise, et cetera. So it's, it's a funny one because sometimes the weather and my body might not line up, 
but a lot of it is going to be weather dependent. So I have to be mentally ready to push through some big days when I don't feel like it because the next day there might be a headwind coming. Yeah. So a lot of it's going to depend on what the skipper is instructing me. And my husband and I make the joke that thank goodness the skipper is the one telling me or we, I don't know what that would do for our relationship because there's going to be days <laughs> where I will, I, I, I will have to push through when it's better coming from the skipper. But um, yeah, so, so, you know, the furthest I've raced before is the Molokai 52 kilometer uh, right. paddle, um, mm -hmm. Molokai to Oahu. So it's a different, much different pace to racing, long and slow. So trying to go in strong yep. um, and be prepared for some big days. Yeah, absolutely. Now you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different facets to putting a project like this together. There's the logistics, there's the, the health and well-being. And then there's the commercial side of it. You've talked about some sponsors already. Have you got a lot of other sponsors coming on board? Is there a few in the pipeline? Yeah, so I feel really, really um, honoured to um, have Sean Partners on board. So they've done a lot. Um, so uh, Earl Evans um, and Alan there at Shore and Partners, they've done a lot for this sport of surf life saving and ocean ski racing. So um, the professional ocean racing series is supported by Shore and Partners and, um, you know, they put on a great event. The prize money is excellent for the athletes and gives the athletes what they deserve. Uh, the summer of surf series run through surf life saving this year is, is um, backed by Shore and Partners. So they're doing some amazing things. And um, I felt very lucky when they came on board and, they've really allowed this to happen. So as I said, there's some big expenses with fuel, food, skipper, boat hire, um, the list goes on. Um, I've also got, you know, some product sponsors that have come on board. You know, you're looking at things like your sunny, so Oakley are on board. You're looking at things like um, your vitamins, so Boost have come on board. Um, you know, Bennett, Surf Life Saving have come on board with my paddles, Nordic, um, surf skis they're amazing they're um, giving me a, a couple of different skis to use actually of different um, levels so I've mm -hmm. got an advanced an intermediate and a beginner ski um, mm -hmm. if you've got a day where you're really fatigued you might not really be up to paddling the advanced ski yeah. um, so it's just piecing together you know um, mega burner doing uh, my supplements so it's piecing it together it's looking at all of your um, expenses or, or equipment that you might need and, and, and really looking at, um, you know, who might be able to help you out with those. So um, very, very fortunate to have picked those guys up. Yeah, great. So if you're watching today and you're a representative from an organization that you think might want to be able to jump in and help Bonnie in her amazing adventure, I'm going to put Bonnie's contact details in the show notes today. So you're going to be able to reach out to Bonnie and offer her that support. And uh, that would be fantastic if you could do that because projects like this, they need support. How long do you anticipate that this is going to actually take you to complete, Bonnie? Yeah, great question. Well, I uh, just had my Guinness World Record um, uh, outline approved the other day. So the current record is at uh, 10 months and 22 days. So I've got to try and get around before then. Um, I'm aiming for six to seven months. So I'd love to say six. Seven would be if a little bit went wrong with the weather, et cetera. Uh, six months would allow for one to two weather days per week and around that 80 kilometers a day um, average. So six, seven months is what we're aiming for. Okay, six or seven months. That's, uh, that's getting along a bit, isn't it? You know, when you take it all into consideration. Now, the Australian coastline, is a, as you've already mentioned, is a very varied coastline. It's rugged in a lot of different places, but it also has some spectacular parts. Are you going to take any time out to have a day resting on a beautiful white sandy beach somewhere or what? Oh, I absolutely hope so. Maybe when I'm coming back down the coastline at the end, that beautiful, you know, Whit Sundays area. I don't know. I, I hope that there's some parts I, you know, of the so many parts of the country I'd love to see, like um, Monkey Mia in Western Australia, and you know, there's beautiful deserted beaches. Um, I'm also really looking forward to um, possibly um, seeing some of the in, indigenous uh, groups, you know, up north, and spending some time with them and learning about their culture as well. So. Um, I make the joke that this is really going to improve my geography of Australia. Um, it hasn't always been a strong point, but I'll get to know uh, the different, um, you know, parts of the coastline very well by the end. So I think I'm really looking forward to the surprises that pop up along the way and maybe areas that people haven't ever talked about because they're so hard to access and I'll be paddling right past them. Yeah, great. Now, has there been a, uh, a production house come on board yet to make a documentary about this amazing feat? How, how's that going? 
Yeah, that's a great question again. So we've chased a couple of ones up, but uh, it's, it's always hard when you're selling a bit of an idea until you have footage. So that space is still well and truly open. So if you know of anyone, you know, send the ideas or contacts my way, that's for sure. But we will be looking, we've got a, a videographer full time on the boat. So I think we're going to be getting some amazing footage. Um, a videographer is working um, with me at the moment and sort of filming um, everything leading in. So we are looking at making a production post. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Well, again, if you're watching this today and I've got a lot of uh, videographer and production mates around the world. So if you're watching this uh, and you want to help out Bonnie, you know where to contact her through the show notes. Now you are a dietitian, so you must have all the nutrition side of it sorted out. How many calories do you anticipate burning a day? I know it's going to, it's going to be crazy. Like I'm actually really looking forward to sort of using myself as a bit of a guinea pig, to be honest, because it's just crazy. Like upwards of 10,000 calories a day, wow. to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. a, absolutely. A big one is obviously getting, um, you know, the different macronutrients at different times there, but um, certainly it's going to be interesting whether I'm more in that fat burning zone because I'm at a lower intensity. So certainly increasing probably the good fats on what I normally would have in a day because we do very high intensity training. Um, definitely looking at the immune system and things like your greens and your vitamin C. So I have organized them through boost and mega burn. I will be having supplements on top of what I'll be eating because it's just extremely hard to meet all those needs. Um, you know, 10 hours of paddling a day, your body's recovering and just constantly burning calories essentially. So um, looking at hydration as well. I mean, Carla Gilbert did a paddle across the Gulf of Carpentaria um, back a, a couple of, oh, probably 15 years ago, I think she was saying. And she said they were going through like two liters of water an hour. She just wow. said it was so hot. So mm. hydration is a huge one and getting those electrolytes in, as you know, with, with your sweat, you're not just losing water. So it's going to be interesting. So I've got a bit of a plan, but adapting as well, I think. Have you got a university on board to do any scientific um, data analysis on you at all during this trip? Yeah, we, it, it's an interesting one. Um, my skipper has sailed around Australia before and he's a marine biologist. So he's done a lot of study on marine life and, and seagrass and things like that. So whether he does some research through that, um, we haven't chatted about that yet, but it's a possibility as well. There's a lot of... Um, you know, grants and, and yeah, universities, there's a lot of opportunities to do that. So um, that's definitely a possibility and something we'll explore in the next couple of months. Now we've got the commercial side sort of sorted. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, one other thing I wanted to ask you today is we've just seen the conclusion of the uh, Olympic games, both the uh, able body and the para Olympians and all those Olympians now have gone home to their respective countries around the world. And I know that scene pretty well. And I know a lot of those athletes will be going through some kind of depression and letdown process now after having that high of achieving their, you know, their lifetime goals. What have you, have you started thinking about what happens after this event and, and coming off that massive adrenaline high that you'll have by doing this amazing uh, adventure? Absolutely. And I think that's an excellent point. And I think anyone's sort of kidding themselves if they say you wouldn't have some sort of a, a come down after the high, um, yeah, I mean, even, you know, the build up, there's a lot of emotions involved. Um, you know, you're very busy during the paddle. Again, it's about having that direct and tangible goal each day and achieving. So as athletes, we're very hard on ourselves. We're always looking for the next thing to achieve. Um, certainly, I think, you know, with this project, there's three parts of it for me. There's the personal achievement there's um, sharing it with others, which is where the videography and that kind of thing comes in. And I think at this time, it's more important than any other. Um, and the third one is doing good with it. So for me, it goes beyond the paddle and it's about helping others at this time. So whether, you know, post we're doing the, you know, a documentary or writing about my experiences or continuing to help help in that space of mental health, I don't know exactly what it will look like yet, but I know that post I'll still be, um, yeah, wanting, wanting to, to help others. And I think I'm starting to get that in my mind and accept that there might be a little bit of low time, but I think you've got to be organized and planned, plan, you know, ahead. And at the end of the day, as a dietitian, I've got a dietitian taking over my clinic. So I haven't lost my jobs. I'm able to come back to those. So it might be getting back in the clinic 
and back into that routine quite quickly. And I think it's hard because a lot of professional athletes don't have that nine to five job. Um, certainly I've got that to come back to. So I think that will really help. Yeah, cool. Good answer. Now, um, what can people do who are listening and watching today? Are there any specific areas of expertise that you're still looking for as part of the overall project team that you need help on? Yeah, absolutely. I think certainly um, in terms of web design and the website, that's obviously where people go to explore. So I had a friend help me out with that, something we sort of got together really quickly in the initial, initial stages. So that's a huge one because that's half of your selling point. Um, and the other one is I don't really have a, a clothing sponsor on board yet as well. So that's sort of an area that's still open. So um, sort of that, yeah, web design, clothing space. Um, they're kind of the two at the moment. Yeah. Okay. We'll see what we can do to help you in, in those Thank areas. You. Now talking about clothing, um, each day when you get to sit on the kayak and paddle away for 10 hours plus, um, what are you going to be wearing? What, what's the attire need to be for you to you know, keep healthy and protected as well? Yeah, so um, I've had Vicobi come on board um, who are amazing. They do paddling gear. Um, they actually do a lot of sailing gear as well. So each day I'm going to cover up as much as possible. So even when it's hot, you want to be popping layers on because the sun, the Australian sun is so harsh and I'm naturally pretty fair. So I'm very aware of it. Um, so it's going to look something like a hat with literally one of those flaps, like right down, almost fully covered, long sleeves, uh, long pants, um, you know, looking for white colours, which, you know, um, don't draw the sun. So black, obviously not good. It heats uh -huh. up. Uh -huh. So light colours, um, but also wearing gloves and booties to protect your feet and your hands from blisters. So being in the salt water for 10 hours Salt is very, very harsh on the skin, as anyone who swims in the ocean or paddles might know. So I'll probably have to, um, you know, douse myself in fresh water every couple of hours to get rid of that salt. And at the moment, I'm experimenting um, with different paddling clothing that's not going to rub as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a big learning curve at the moment. And I did a 35K paddle and my hands were a bit cut up after. So that sort of um, definitely made me realize I needed the gloves um, and I've been getting some blisters on my feet with the excess K's too. So you won't be seeing much other than just my face. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be yeah. covered by a pair of Oakley's as well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And some really thick zinc as well. So um, yeah, absolutely. Every head to toe, you got to think about sun protection. Let's hope that a fisherman doesn't uh, mis misplace you and throw you into their net, yeah? Because they might think you're some kind of sea creature. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and anything I can do to make myself not look like a seal as well is ideal. So my ski is white and I'll be dressed in white. So that might help me also. So do you have an actual departure date set in concrete yet? When is that? Yeah. Yep. So 19th of December, um, I'm going to launch from Karawa Surf Club here on the Gold Coast. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's their nipper breakup day. A lot of the nippers will be along the coast. Um, I want to encourage the local community to come along. Um, you know, we'll be having a little media event upstairs and then heading off the, uh, off the coastline and, and heading south. And I've already got some people committed to doing the first 100K with me, which is down to Byron Bay, the iconic Byron Bay. Yep. Um, so that'll be great. And I think that support, I can really feel that support kind of now and, people wanting to jump in along the way, which will, which will really help me. I think that there's definitely going to be areas, lonely, deserted stretches, but um, having people who have given me their word to jump in here and there is, is just great. And I'm looking forward to that. So on that note, are people going to be able to track your progress online? Are you going to have wear a tracker of some description? Yeah, it's really interesting. Absolutely. So part of the Guinness World Records, you've got to have a tracker, a logbook, witnesses, uh, video evidence. There's a bunch of different stuff. Uh, yep, I'll have a live tracker. Um, people can follow me every day on social media, which is through my uh, page at Bonnie Hancock. So Instagram as well as Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, people can follow every day. I'm going to be um, doing live vlogs every day. Um, you know, live video feed from the boat. We'll put the drone up as well. I'll have the GoPro on. So we're really going to be interacting with people a lot. 
Um, and yeah, as I said, we've, we've got the videographer and, you know, my husband's going to help out as well with that part. So I'll just have to paddle and not worry too much and they'll be all over it. <laughs> Brilliant. So people watching and listening who do want to jump on a, a kayak and come and support you, they can get in touch via the website and, and just say, Hey, yeah. I'll, I'll be at this place and I can meet you there. Okay. Fantastic. That's good. Well, I'll tell you what, Bonnie, I'd love to have you back on the show after you've completed this, because I have no doubt in my mind you're going to scream around Australia in your kayak and um, come back and tell us all how it was. And uh, we'll probably have to have 10 shows to break it all down, but uh, you can at least give Absolutely. us a little bit of a feeling on, on what, it, what it's all like. But uh, I'd really like to thank you very much for sharing your journey with us today on the Global Sports Channel. It's been amazing speaking to you, and I wish you all the very best of luck in this amazing adventure you're about to go and do. Thank you so much. Not long to go now, about 10 weeks. So yeah, follow the journey along and um, yeah, really looking forward to sharing it with you guys. Brilliant. So if you're watching again, uh, check all the show notes today. I'll put all the contact details, get onto Bonnie's Instagram, follow her on that and uh, you'll be able to keep track of her also on the website and through all the other processes. So thanks very much for joining us today, Bonnie.